I can unlock my phone with my face, you can access your bank account with your voice, and fingerprints are often the key information on a national ID card. All of this, face, voice, fingerprints, there are biometrics, unique algorithmic measurements of us that are revolutionizing the process of identification. But biometrics are far from perfect. Their convenience and seeming infallibility comes at a price. Most crucially, our privacy. Our biometrics are individual, unique. So much so that they've always served as a gold standard for identification, with really high levels of accuracy and strong security. Fingerprints and DNA databases have been the mainstay for police and investigators for decades, and across many parts of the world, people who are illiterate use thumbprints in place of written signatures. Stephanie Hare has been researching the growing use of biometrics. There's also your face now, which is being recorded, so that's just your facial point, and that's called facial recognition technology. Your voice is biometric data. There's also something called gait analysis, which is how you walk. So those are ways that they can identify you. And another way is behavioral biometrics. That might be your online behavior, so how you use your mouse, where you click on things as you go through the internet, but even how regularly you're posting on Facebook. There's a lot that you can, can get just from people's ordinary lives. And that's why it's so important to have this debated in society so we all are giving our consent about whether or not we want such technology being used, and if so, under what circumstances and with what regulatory checks. The world is on a mission, a mission to give everybody a legal identity by 2030. That was a target set by the United Nations as part of its Sustainable Development Goals campaign. The key segment of the population that the UN is focusing on is the more than one billion people who currently have no way to prove their identity. The unverified include millions of refugees, trafficked children, homeless and other people who never get a chance to establish documents and create a digital footprint that's so essential for modern life. Here at Zuttery Camp, the United Nations World Food Programme is using biometric technology, iris scans, to provide aid to the camp's 75,000 Syrian residents. Refugees can shop for their groceries with the blink of an eye. No need for a bank card or registration papers. The system is quite aptly named iPay. When a shopper has their iris scanned, the World Food Programme system verifies the person's identity against a biometric database held by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, the UNHCR. Then it checks the account balance, confirms the purchase, and prints an iPay receipt. All of this happens in seconds, and according to the World Food Programme, this not only makes transactions quicker, but more secure. Here in Jordan, we use biometrics authentication for two main reasons. One, to guarantee 100% accountability on the identity of the person purchasing and using the assistance that we provide. And secondly, to facilitate the redemption process of the beneficiaries. By not using a card, by not using a PIN, in camps, which is an environment where beneficiaries tend to go to the supermarket multiple times during the month, for them going with their own iris, it's easier than going with a card or a pin. Watching the iris-enabled shopping process is both fascinating and a bit unnerving. This is a super high-tech system that's been rolled out in what you could call a low-rights environment. Sure, people here are under the protection of the United Nations and have more rights than they would have in the war zones of the countries they fled from, such as Syria. However, they also have little choice when it comes to giving up their biometrics or opting out of biometrics programs. 
Taking somebody's biometric data from them is about the most personal data that you could take. These are not people who necessarily are in a position to ask for legal representation to have this explained to them. Second, if they don't want it, what is the alternative that they can exercise instead? Are they using behavioral psychology, something called nudge theory, to make it where it's just easier to hand over your data and then you get your food and your clothes and your money faster? Because that would be unethical. We're testing out, again, extremely experimental, really invasive technology on people who literally have some of the um, least rights and protections of anyone. Would a middle-class person living in France or Germany or the United States or the United Kingdom or Sweden consent to, to use their iris to pay for things or to transact? Probably not. It's easy to see the immense potential of the iPay system to track aid disbursement, smooth out payments and reduce the chances of corruption or fraud. The World Food Programme says the benefits go even further. They are able to monitor shopping habits and nutritional intake, and there's a possibility in the future that the credit histories of the refugees could help them open bank accounts or get loans. They also think they've got the security bit covered. So WFP regulates the management of data of refugees through a data sharing agreement with UNHCR. So through that agreement, we are able to access the data, sensitive data, which again, does not include name, just the case ID, phone number and location. So we are confident that the data being encrypted is well protected. The reason why we are doing regularly data privacy and impact assessment on the project to guarantee that if there are new threats in the world, we are able to tackle them and, uh, and address them properly before they come to us. UNHCR remain fully committed to their biometrics registration program, so much so that they're rapidly expanding it, with the aim of being active in 75 countries by 2020. There remains lots of problematic questions, though, that are yet to be fully answered, such as, is the tech foolproof? Who has access? And how can anyone plan for the unforeseen issues to come? These are the kinds of questions that have made other aid organisations pause before jumping on board with biometric technology. In 2015, Oxfam voluntarily imposed a moratorium on its use of biometrics in its work. It stated, Given the number of unknowns around most effective operation and governance models, and risks of this incredibly sensitive data falling into the wrong hands, we felt it was best not to become an early adopter. One field in which biometrics has long been used is security and surveillance. And facial recognition is one of the most popular technologies right now. In China, there's been an exponential increase in the use of facial tracking and artificial intelligence to monitor citizens. The United States also currently operates one of the largest facial recognition systems in the world, with a database of 117 million Americans, with photos typically drawn from driver's licenses. And in the UK, police forces have been trialling live facial recognition since 2016, at public spaces such as shopping centres, football matches, protests, music events and crowded city spots. So this green van that's behind me here in central London is part of a facial recognition technology trial that's been run by the Metropolitan Police. And what it's doing is it's basically scanning people's faces when they walk past and then comparing that to a database that has wanted offenders or suspects on it. The Met Police say facial recognition could enable them to more easily protect people, prevent offences and bring offenders to justice. However, privacy groups such as Big Brother Watch say the technology is authoritarian and lawless. The group's legal and policy officer, Griff Ferris, even goes so far as to say that facial recognition is possibly the most dangerous surveillance mechanism that's ever been invented. This facial recognition technology can capture up to 300 faces a second, which uh, could be around 18,000 faces in a minute. It's a vast, vast number of people uh, whom the police can identify, check against police databases, whether that's police or immigration. So what we're seeing is police being able to identify people in, in seconds. That puts so much power in the hands of the state and the police, which I think is fundamentally wrong. 
Um, it's not democratically accountable because there's no legal basis for this. So this is a, an intense, intrusive and authoritarian surveillance technology. While advocates for facial recognition would debate some of Griff's assertions, one thing is undeniable. The technology currently being used by the UK police is dangerously inaccurate. Latest figures show that 96% of the Met Police's so-called matches were misidentifications. And there's research showing that many facial recognition algorithms will disproportionately misidentify darker skin tones and women. The causes are numerous and they vary, ranging from poor quality CCTV images to the fact that the algorithms are often trained, so to speak, using faces that are mostly white and male. This technology looks like a really nice, quick fix to the fact that we have not got as much money to pay for human intelligence operations. So it sounds great in theory. The problem is it doesn't work very well on people who are not white men, which is quite a lot of the population on the planet. Being arrested wrongfully means that you get put into predictive policing algorithms. So the more often you're having contact with law enforcement, the more you are at risk of being stopped again, even erroneously, and also people in your network because they build the network out. It's never just about you. Proponents of facial recognition in the UK will argue that issues with accuracy can be fixed. They aren't wrong. Technology can always be improved on. What's a bigger concern is that currently there are no laws governing the use of facial technology in the country, whether it's the state using it or even private companies. I think what's really troubling at the moment is the technology is being rolled out without legislation and empowered regulators. This is not technology that has a very good track record of being accountable, so I can find out A, who's using it, under what circumstances, what's, do what's done with the data, where's it stored, what's the track record of cybersecurity on keeping that data protected, all of these things, we have no idea. It's just being rolled out. When people feel that they're being observed all the time, that has a really chilling effect. So things like your right to protest, your right to go to a job interview, to hang out with some friends, to go to church. These are things that perhaps the state doesn't have a right to keep an eye on. The Met Police have defended the trials, saying they're, quote, overt, and that members of the public are informed through posters and leaflets. But at the trial I was at, overt wouldn't be the word I'd use. There were literally hundreds of people rushing through the space. And the chances of seeing the tiny signs, reading the leaflets, or even understanding what the unmarked van was being used for were minimal. I stopped a few people to see what they thought of the trial. It's another level of invasion of privacy, yeah, but then we live in that world. In my opinion, I think it's like a good thing to have facial recognition because like, as long as you're not doing anything bad, and it also helps the police track people down. To be honest, the way technology is going at the moment, this will be the norm all around the world. So I think we just need to get used to it. If you've done nothing wrong, there's no issue. Take a look around you in the world. This technology is already being used by certain countries. All you have to do is pick up a newspaper and see people who are being incarcerated in concentration camps in China right now. Biometrics data is part of that. That's how they're monitoring those people and tracking them and anyone who comes into contact with them, right? So there's your proof of concept of what could be done. Now, it's really easy to go, that would never happen here, but your government can always change, right? So history is full of examples that even in liberal democracies, in times of war, in times of economic difficulty, people get voted into power who change. So you have to think about how a system is being built and what it could be used for years down the road when there's a very different political flavor. The UK collects biometrics from another key segment of the population, one that many wouldn't have even considered, children. Few are aware that schools have been recording the biometrics of children for the past 20 years. It is estimated that since 1999, approximately 70 to 80% of children in the UK have interacted with some sort of biometric device in school. Pippa King is a parent, campaigner for children's rights and creator of the Biometrics in School blog. I think companies are putting the tech into a school setting because you've got a compliant population. School children won't ask um, or question if they're being surveilled a little bit more than the general population simply because they don't know any better. The concern that I have with biometrics in schools is that sort of way back in 1999 and throughout the whole of that next decade into 2000 is that we as an adult population weren't using biometrics at all, not even on phones. And suddenly we had children as young as three and four using their fingerprint to get in and out of school systems. 
The growth of affordable biometric technology means that fingerprints, iris scans, facial recognition and infrared palm scanning have been used to speed up access to canteens, libraries, registrations, payments and lockers. A big selling point, of course, has been security. Biometric-enabled access is seen as a foolproof way of keeping school buildings safer. However, a big concern is how robust these systems are. Who has access to the biometric data? Is there a process for deletion? And what happens if the system is compromised? I also sent the Department of Education a few years ago a Freedom of Information request about have they checked the software, have they checked encryption standards, uh, is it adhering to sort of international standards at the hardware, is it secure? Nobody could answer. No, no, we've never checked a system, no, we don't know if they adhere to international standards. It just seems to have sort of been gone under the carpet and nobody's aware of you know, what's in schools, what's being sold to schools, who has access to it and whether or not there's been any biometric data breaches. For entire generations of British schoolchildren, questions of consent around their biometrics have been bypassed to a great extent. It was only in 2012 that a law was enacted putting in place processes for consent to be given or withheld. The overall effect of biometrics in schools, however, is that the sharing and use of very personal data and the implications of surveillance are being normalised. The test bed for smart cities isn't necessarily the tech, because we've got the tech already, it's acceptance of it. And if you go into schools and you desensitise and normalise the surveillance technology, the smart city is there already, nobody's sort of objecting to it. So uh, I think there's a good argument sort of for us all to be a little bit uh, wary of the word smart, and especially when it's sort of with smart cities or smart motorways, because it is just essentially a surveillance. It would be one thing if extensive biometric systems were being just used by governments or state-funded organisations like the UN. It wouldn't make the lack of accountability or inaccuracy or outdated security protocols any easier to live with, but at least across many countries, governments can be questioned and pressured to give answers of some form. The reality, however, is that biometrics are increasingly being used by private companies. Shopping malls, recruitment agencies, online DNA and ancestry services, and even private security companies. All of them are taking and using our biometrics. And finding out how the technology is being used, what data is being stored and with whom it's being shared, not just today, but also in the future, involves a lot of probing, because these aren't transparent systems. Biometric technology is being developed and used much faster than any regulations are being created. And in many senses, it feels as though we're sitting on a ticking time bomb. We don't even have an established field of ethics for technology. There's voluntary codes by companies. These are not legally enforceable. You as a citizen or a consumer cannot use these to protect you in any way, so derive no comfort from that. So I think we're entering a really interesting space in terms of what it means to be human, because as we become a more quantified world, there's going to be such a temptation to take all data about you and reduce you to zeros and ones. That is what is coming. And whether or not you want that to happen has to be something that's discussed. Yet we're rolling this technology out and saying that this is going to change the way that we work and live within the next 5, 10, 20 years. To me, that's really worrying. We need to elevate ethics for technology right to the top of the agenda. Thanks for watching part four of this five part series. Uh, if you're interested in watching any of the other episodes, uh, we cover a diverse range of topics ranging from the use of algorithms in social security and welfare in Australia uh, to online manipulation in Mexico and even the concept of data colonization. Uh, so I hope you check them out as well. If you want to see them, you can use the hashtag all hail the algorithm on Twitter uh, or you can go to the website aljazeera.com forward slash all hail the algorithm.